morning. I'm Bonnie Gardner. I'm co-chair of the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. Our forums occur most Sundays at noon, and they are free and open to the public. We would welcome for you to attend. Our mission is to nourish the mind and the spirit and serve social justice. Today, I'm honored to introduce County Commissioner Bridget Shea who's going to be speaking on traffic, toll roads, and property taxes. All of us are all too aware of increasingly snarled traffic and a lack of adequate public transportation. This is an important quality of life issue for us, and it's also adversely impacting our local economy. So uh, Bridget Shea is going to be talking about her ideas for moving forward with some proposed solutions that are practical, least disruptive, and environmentally sound to address these traffic congestion problems and improving local uh, transportation. Uh, let me briefly tell you a little bit about her. She arrived in Austin in 1988 and started the Texas chapter of Clean Water Action. Previously, she had been an award-winning journalist at national public radio stations in Minnesota and Philadelphia. She served on the city council in Austin from 93 to 96. She was known widely as an environmental champion, a consumer uh, protection champion, etc. She co-founded Save Our Springs and helped achieve legal protection for Barton Springs. She's advised the Lower Colorado River Authority, Season the Hospital, the city of Austin, among many others. Recently, her work for a client led to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality Environmental Excellence Award. She serves on many boards. She has certainly been incredibly successful in every venture that she's ever undertaken. We're so fortunate to have her as our county commissioner now. She's a graduate of Leadership Austin, a member of the Chamber of Commerce Clean Energy Council, She's been our county commissioner since 2014. Let's give a warm welcome to County Commissioner Bridget Shea. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here today. Um, I'm going to say something real briefly about property taxes and then um, get into the, the comments about the traffic and toll roads. Um, we actually have had two community forums here um, on the whole broken property tax appraisal process. Have many of you been able to attend that? Looks like some of you might have. Um, it's a, there's a structural problem uh, that is essentially forcing residential property taxpayers to subsidize commercial property uh, because of a gaming of the system, really, and loopholes in the system. Uh, there is a chronic underappraisal of commercial property, and it has been shifting a growing and unfair burden onto homeowners. And it's part of what's contributing to Austin becoming increasingly unaffordable for many of us who helped make Austin such a great place to live. Um, so we've been working on that. Um, I have to say my hat's off to Mayor Steve Adler. He has um, absolutely been a champion to bring a legal challenge um, to this underappraisal of commercial property. And if they are successful, it will be truly historic. There were many attempts to try and get the legislature to act. <coughs> It's a lot like the school finance issue in many ways. The legislature has refused to correct a clear problem of underfunding of public schools, so the school districts have had to sue the state. And that case is working its way through the courts. It's very similar here. The legislature has refused to correct a structural flaw in the appraisal process, and so the city of Austin has had to sue. And I'm very hopeful that that, that lawsuit will be successful. Um, the major issue that I want to talk with you about today really is traffic and what kind of uh, real solutions are available to our community. I think all of us share an enormous frustration with traffic problems. But I want to challenge a, um, a very common misperception, and I hear it frequently, and that is that uh, back in the 80s, um, there was a view by Austin of that era that if we didn't build it, they wouldn't come. And so, therefore, we didn't build the roads we needed to build. Well, that, that's like an urban myth. It is just simply not accurate. There were very thoughtful decisions made by the community that we did not want to um, vivisect our community 
with massive uh, highway infrastructure that has proven over and over and over again to be harmful in many other places. There was a proposal to make a, um, a major highway out of Koenig Lane. How many of you remember that? Yeah, the community fought that. Um, and it wasn't because we wanted to roll up the sidewalks and, and tell everybody to go away. It was because it would have been harmful to the community. How many of you remember a plan to make a super um, crosstown highway on Cesar Chavez? That was a, that was a long time ago. And I've, I've got a little video in here that will give you at the end an image of what that um, could have looked like if this community had decided to go that way. But there was a resounding vote against it. And it, again, wasn't because we wanted to put up, um, you know, no vacancy signs on the city limits. It's because we correctly understood as a community that that would be harmful to our community. So I want to dispense with that, that urban myth at, at the get-go. I think people want um, good and healthy and effective transportation solutions for the community. Unfortunately, I think we have, again, a, um, I'm going to just call it a dysfunctional process for making um, decisions about roadway expansions. And the chief one is the, the Central Texas Regional Mobility Authority, the CTRMA. And I'm just going to use RMA or Toll Road Authority as the shorthand for that uh, in the rest of my comments. They were literally created to bypass a lot of the public process and build roads quickly. And they are in the process of doing that. And I think by not taking into account the community concerns and um, thoughtful critiques uh, they could potentially cause a lot of harm in our community. And the chief project that is um, underway now and where I think we still have a chance to potentially uh, find a better course, a better direction for the Toll Road Authority to take is the South Mopac expansion. Um, are many of you aware that, that this project very recently doubled in size and, in fact, the Toll Road Authority is now claiming that the doubling of that toll uh, infrastructure will necessitate them building a double-decker toll bridge on top of Mopac over Lady Bird Lake. Are people aware of that? Can I just see a show of hands? Who's aware of that? Many in our community are not aware of this, and yet the Toll Road Authority has essentially gotten all the approvals that it needs to do that. This diagram behind me is um, one that they showed at a community forum, but they do not readily make this available. Actually. They, they presented this to a, a group of environmental leaders. Someone took a picture with their phone, and that's the source of this. It's been hard for, we've, they've not been wanting to release this because I think they understand this is a, a, a hideous image. I have, I have no other words for it. Uh, the idea that they would build a double-decker toll bridge on top of Mopac over Lady Bird Lake and create a visual blight on, the, on our jewel of our our Lady Bird Lake in the middle of our downtown would create a drum of noise, sound, sound echoes over water. So if you put a cap on top of Mopac in between the lanes, you create a drum and echo effect of noise. It would be harmful to the lake, to the hike and bike trail, to Zilker Park, to the nature center, uh, to the garden. Um, and um, most recently, in official uh, record comments, the Wildflower Center, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, submitted official comments to TxDOT about this uh, plan for widening South Mopac and ultimately connecting it to I-35, that it would, in fact, cause harm or take at the Wildflower Center, which is a technical term for essentially scientific harm. So. We are, we're in, a, in an unusual situation where the toll road authority has all the authority that it needs to do something that I believe would be truly harmful for our community. We have uh, succeeded in slowing them down. They have agreed to uh, go through an additional um, environmental review process. And they have agreed to at least uh, consider some alternative proposals from the city. So that's the stage we're at. We are hosting a second community forum on this issue November 9th at Austin High from 6 to 8 p.m. and we'd urge everybody to come. The next day, the Toll Road Authority is having their open house, but they do it in small stations. 
Uh, there's not uh, one conversation with an opportunity for people to ask questions and hear the answers from other people's questions. It's broken up into small stations where you move around the room and hear individually, uh, but there's no sharing of information. And to me, that's a, that's a real downside to that process. But that's the following night, November 10th at Palmer Auditorium. We're doing our community forum November 9th, and I invite you all to come and, and participate. Um, but I, I think it's important for people to, to see this diagram. The, um, the pole in the middle is, is uh, where they would elevate it, and then they would uh, propose to expand uh, toll lanes on the inside. Um, and I, I'm not opposed to all toll lanes, although I'm not a fan of them. Um, I do think that uh, we, we have to find lots of solutions, and we've got to have many options for transportation. Um, I was willing to live with the proposal for one toll lane in each direction on South Mopac, which had been their proposal for a very long time. And this last February of this year, um, they announced this dramatic expansion, which was the doubling of the toll lanes. They had a public comment period for 10 days, closed that public comment period, and then attempted to amend an old regional plan um, which was about to expire. So there, there, was not a, there was not a good faith public process on this uh, ex dramatic expansion proposal that the Toll Road Authority conducted. And that's been part of our, our pitch to them as well. If you want to have any respect or integrity with this community, you must do a complete public process. And you must have a full discussion with the community about what you're really building. Because while they have not said it very clearly, if you press them and look at their documents, it appears that part of the reason why they are building this expanded capacity or proposing to build it on South Mopac is because they intend to connect South Mopac with I-35 and essentially turn Mopac into a western bypass for I-35 cars and trucks. And while the, the chair of the regional transportation planning body said everyone knows we're planning on doing that, at a, a, a meeting this spring, I said, no, I don't think everyone does know that. And in fact, the planning process has been so fractured and fragmented and broken into pieces so as not to say clearly and uh, fully to the community, look, this is what we're proposing. We want to make MOPAC a Western Bypass for I-35. What do you think of that? That conversation's never taken place. And I tell people it's almost as if our, planning pl our road planning process is being conducted like a game of pickup sticks where you win if the road segments or the sticks don't touch each other because they're not looking at the connection of all of these plans. So it's really not possible to have a comprehensive transportation planning process by the way it's currently set up. So that's my big critique on this. And I'm going to walk you through what I think are some very promising um, developments on the horizon. And I'm going to premise it by just asking, how many people have a smartphone? Did you imagine even 10 years ago that you would be watching television or movies or videos from your grandchildren or whatever on your telephone? A few technology savvy people say, yeah, I knew that was coming. Most of us did not. And, and the speed at which our telecommunications infrastructure has transformed should give us some insight into how our transportation infrastructure can transform and the speed at which some of these changes will happen. It, the, the change has been so dramatic with phones that AT&T uh, filed an application with the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, not long ago to abandon their poles and lines. So, so we, are, we, are, we are in an era of some fairly dramatic technological transformation, and one of the biggest ones is in the arena of the automobile. Um, I think many of you have seen, we can go to the next, um, the next slide. <clears throat> this is really just a reminder of how beautiful Town Lake is and how much our community has invested in that treasure, and we should fight to protect it, not you know, blindly allow an anonymous toll road authority to ruin it. Um, the next slide, please. Oh, recently. Um, just uh, this last month, on September 14th, 
uh, Mayor Adler uh, announced a partnership with the Rocky Mountain Institute. And my office at the county was very involved in, um, in pitching hard to the Rocky Mountain Institute that they, that they should pick Austin to be the mobility city of the future. And uh, essentially what they will do, and, and we won, there was a nationwide competition or selection. We didn't apply. They sought out the cities, um, and we won. But what that will mean is they will dedicate staff for the next three to five years to working with the city to figure out how a city transitions from the infrastructure of the horseless carriage, which was how we understood automobiles when they first came. They were a carriage without a horse the horseless carriage, and we've built our infrastructure for the horseless carriage. So how, how do cities transition from the horseless carriage to the driverless carriage, the driverless car, the autonomous car? And that's one of the things that Rocky Mountain Institute is going to be helping us figure out and, and hopefully creating uh, some lessons that we can uh, share with the world. Next slide, please. I think many of you have also seen the news about Google announcing that Austin is the second location for uh, piloting their autonomous vehicles. How many of you have seen that? How many of you have actually seen the, the cars driving around the neighborhoods? They're, they're actually doing a lot of loops in the uh, Allendale uh, section of, um, of Austin and, and increasing into other areas, Mueller as well. Um, this is just one, one piece of this puzzle. Google's not a car manufacturer. Uh, neither is Apple. Um, and the car manufacturers have been uh, noticing and following what's been going on with the technology sector for a while now. And there is effectively an arms race, if you will, underway among the car manufacturers and the technology companies to see who can bring this new technology to market first. Well, um, if any of you have seen uh, television advertising for cars, you know there's a whole lot of autonomous features already in cars that are being sold now. How many of you have seen the ad where the woman's backing out of her driveway with her children in the back and the, car, and the school bus comes down the street? She doesn't see it, but the car does, and the car stops in time. Have you all seen that? Um, that's an autonomous feature. Uh, another one that features um, a notification if you're drifting in the lane. Um, uh, cruise control is also part of uh, an autonomous feature. But most modern cars have many of these features already built in. It's not a big leap um, to get to the next stage. Next slide, please. There are a number of different sources on this, but um, there is a broad belief, and, and, um, and more and more data now coming out, that autonomous cars will be commonplace within a certain time frame. There's disagreement about what the length of that time frame is. But again, if we look to Moore's law and how rapidly technology changed with smartphones, the iPhone was only introduced eight years ago. Eight years ago. So if Moore's law has any rele relevance, and I believe it does, which, which, spe which speaks to the speed at which uh, technology transforms and evolves, um, this, is, this is probably one of the soonest time frames that I've seen referenced. Next slide, please. Uh, there's a, an excellent article in The um, Economist, and I, I would recommend this to all of you. It's, it's a fairly short article, very well written, very uh, information rich about how much this new technology is transforming our world, because it's, it's in place now in, in, in a number of places. Next slide, please. One of the quotes which I've highlighted is that Google reckons Shared self-driving taxis, so that's part of the paradigm shift. It's not a one-car, one-person model in the future. But self-driving taxis or fleet vehicles could have utilization rates of more than 75%. If so, a much smaller number of cars would be needed to move the same number of people around. There will be fewer cars on the road. Perhaps just 30% of the cars we have today predicts Sebastian Thrun, a computer scientist at Stanford University and a former leader of Google's self-driving car project. Somebody who's somewhat knowledgeable about this subject. Next slide, please. Similarly, research by Dan Fagnant of uh, University of Utah drawing on traffic data from Austin 
found an autonomous taxi with dynamic ride sharing could replace 10 private vehicles. Self-driving vehicles could, in short, reduce urban vehicle numbers by as much as 90%. So you've got a big spread there. You know, 30%, 90%, 5 to 10 years. Next slide, please. <coughs> Navigant. Some respectable research organization. I think people are familiar with them. 85 million autonomous cars to be sold annually by 2035. By combining ride sharing with car sharing, particularly in a city like New York, MIT research has shown it would be possible to take every passenger to their destination at the time they need to be there with 80% fewer cars. So every day, there's new research, new data, next slide please, um, giving us at least some sense that this is not the Jetsons. We're not talking about something that maybe our grandchildren will see. We are talking about a change that will happen in our lifetimes. Uh, this is the other one that's interesting. How many, you all are familiar with Tesla, right? Well, they're planning to build autonomous vehicles. And Uber announced that they would be pre-purchasing 500,000 of Tesla's self-driving vehicles. How many of you have used Uber, Lyft, or some kind of car sharing service? So. Uh, there was a call with investors, uh, and a reporter asked of the head of Tesla, Elon Musk, uh, asked about the plans by Uber to purchase all these self-driving vehicles. And the reporter said, why doesn't Tesla just uh, cut out the middleman and provide those uh, ride services directly to the consumer? And Elon Musk said, that's a very insightful question, and I think I won't answer it right now. So then the, 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 the Twitter universe blew up with stories about will Tesla and Uber be fighting for this kind of service in the future. That's old news already. That was this summer. Next slide, please. So it just gives you an, a hint of how rapidly this universe is changing. Um, I don't know if this is what Apple's car would look like. This may be some artist's rendering of it, but Apple has announced, uh, we'll go to that future slide again, Apple has announced that they are planning to uh, bring a car to market by 2019. Can we go to that next Apple slide, please? That one. Like I said, I don't know if this is what, we, what it would look like, but um, 2019 is right around the corner. Most of the major car manufacturers have plans to introduce autonomous vehicles to market by 2020. So in the Austin region, we have a long-range uh, planning uh, entity called Campo. Have any of you heard of Campo? Did you see a show of hands? Y'all are very well educated. Many, argue, many uh, audiences aren't familiar with this. Campo is called the Central um, the Capital Area Metropolitan Planning Organization, the MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, they do, um, every five years, they do a 25-year long-range transportation plan. We just adopted our 2040 plan um, in May of this year, and there, I think, are maybe 10 words in it about autonomous vehicles. And, they're mo and those words are mostly because I insisted that we look at it for our 25-year long-range transportation plan, and the words are essentially um, we will be looking at uh, the impact of autonomous vehicles in the future. <laughs> so that's our long-range plan for our very smart, technologically savvy community. Um, that, la that plan is a 25-year plan. It will last for 20 years beyond the introduction into the marketplace by the majority of autom automotive manufacturers' autonomous vehicles. And they're already on our roads today. I have a friend who owns a Tesla, and he's uh, called an early adopter. And they do um, um, essentially software updates for his Tesla. The software update that he got two weeks ago allowed him to enter his destination into his Tesla and take his hands off the wheel on Mopac. So there, there are autonomous vehicles operating all over. There's actually one uh, company that's been operating autonomous vehicles uh, all over, I think, most of the world for quite a while now. Anybody have any idea which one it is? 
John Deere tractor. Yes. You can punch in the coordinates on your tractor and you don't even have to do The farmers now drive their tractors from their iPads. I mean, the tractor's going pretty straight rows. and you, you just put in the coordinates for the field. It's not like you're going to bump into another tractor coming at you at high speed. But the, the point is, there are autonomous vehicles operating in many places in the marketplace. Next slide, please. Uh, there was a gathering of um, the technology leaders, the scientists from a number of different uh, entities. Uh, and uh, they were asked to make their top five predictions about the impacts of autonomous vehicles. And these are very interesting. Here's the top five. Uber will eventually build a centrally controlled all-electric autonomous vehicle fleet. I mean, we can see that coming with their plans to pre-purchase 500,000 autonomous Teslas. Uh, the next one, new modes of transit with dynamic routing will reduce overall vehicle ownership and alter urban development patterns. We should be paying attention to this when we're planning a 25-year road investment and network plan that doesn't connect. Third point, gas stations will disappear due to the reduced vehicle ownership and electrification, forcing a restructuring of our gas distribution system. And keep in mind, the gas tax to repair, the gas tax in Texas is the source of funds to repair Texas roadways. So as more and more vehicles electrify, um, the revenue for gas tax to repair the, the Texas roadway system is, is on a steep decline. Next point, the commercial parking industry will consolidate and decline, disrupted by on-demand parking models like Xerox. I'm not sure what that is, but it's an aggregation of, of vehicles, so you don't have them parked because they're in use. They are roving fleets of taxi vehicles. And the last one, connected car startups will bring increasing amounts of vehicle data online, leading to safer, cheaper, and more efficient transportation. These were the, these are the experts in, in the realm who made these predictions. Next slide, please. Um, I've had Google alerts on my Gmail for several years now. Uh, and you can put in the subject line for what you want to keep track of if you have an interest. So I've been reading these on a daily basis for the last three years on autonomous vehicles. I'm not super smart, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a technologist. I've just been reading the news and paying attention to what's happening in the world. This is just one little example of, of, of what you'll get in a Google alert on autonomous vehicles. M City in Detroit Detroit is beating us on technology issues. I find that a point of shame for our community that Detroit from the Rust Belt, no offense any from Detroit, I'm from up north, but M cities in Detroit, University of Michigan is teaching the autonomous cars to drive. They've created a, a city, essentially. Uh, they have a lot of, I guess, empty real estate. And, um, and they're testing out autonomous cars. The next item, annual sales of autonomous capable vehicles are expected to reach 85 million by 2035. Um, Chicago, identifying innovation zones to test driverless cars in the mayor's new Beta City initiative. So many places around the country are moving in this direction. And I felt like we were being left in the dust. And so that was part of the reason why we competed so hard for the Rocky Mountain Institute Mobility Initiative. Next slide, please. Just another indication of what's happening on the roadways. No driver needed. Autonomous trucks will be on Florida roads by the end of the year. I have heard that they will still require a um, driver to be in the seat, but they won't be actually driving, which could frankly solve the problem with drivers falling asleep or other kinds of things related to truckers. Next slide, please. This is an interesting one. Startup aims to beat Google to market with self-driving golf carts. The startup Oro, A-U-R-O, says its self-driving golf cart will lead to autonomous shuttles for theme parks, vacation resorts, and retirement communities, all places where people need help getting around and where they can uh, drive legally under the, the federal limit of 25 miles an hour. Any vehicles going above 25 miles an hour have to meet all different kinds of federal standards. But 25 and below, which is part of the reason why Google cars can drive on the, car, on the roads today, because they are 25 and below. At any rate, next slide, please. Freescale, how many people knew that Freescale was a leader in, in providing the technology for autonomous vehicles? So it's, it, it's having a direct impact on our local economy. We have a number of companies in Austin that are uh, crucial parts of this, this large technology transformation. Next slide, please. So my plea to our toll road authority, 
to our regional mobility authority, to our community leaders is, can we please stop building a system for the horseless carriage? Can we start to anticipate and plan for what is happening in the marketplace and what will have a transformative impact on our community? And it's not to say stop all road building, but it certainly is to say in the case of the toll road authority, don't ruin our downtown because you have a projected traffic count that assumes that everyone will continue driving one person, one car ad infinitum. Technology is changing that calculation. And when I've asked them, are you looking at the impact of autonomous vehicles in your travel demand projections, all of their technical people say no. And I say, why not? And they say, well, we don't know. We don't know what impact it will have. And I said, isn't that a math question? Don't you solve for X? Put in some, put in some, some uh, assumptions. Let's say it only uh, affects uh, uh, capa travel capacity by 10%. What would that do? What if it's 30%? What if it's higher? At least look at it. And they haven't been. So I think we've got a broken transportation planning process in place that could truly threaten our, our community. And we've got a little uh, video, uh, I think it's the next slide, that gives you some sense of, of what could happen uh, if we did all these double-decking plans that they're proposing on the Toll Road Authority. I think if you click on that, it goes to the YouTube video. It's, it's a very, um, very well done and brief little video that imagines what Austin would look like if we double-decked all these bridges, and uh, if we did the kind of roadway expansion that is being proposed by the toll road authority. So that's my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have, and I urge you to get involved in this decision making and not let um, not let the decisions be made for us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bridget. Raise your hands high, and I will call on you, Shirley Weiler. Um, I live um, west of Mopac, and I was told by uh, neighbors before I moved in that 
Mopac was initially presented to the neighbors as a little parkway where people could go Sunday driving kind of thing, and it looks like it's just mushroomed into this Frankenstein image. So are you talking to Northwest Austin neighborhoods? Yes, we are trying to get the word out uh, all up and down because this will have a huge impact on all of Mopac south and north. In fact, it was uh, originally visioned as Mopar Mopac Boulevard. Um, the son of Ann Richards came and spoke at one of our gatherings and said he remembers going to rallies and meetings with his mother, Ann Richards, uh, when, pe when promises were made that trucks would not be allowed on Mopac because it would be a boulevard. Well, clearly that, that's not happening today. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Douglas Bauer. Um, I live in Circle C in southwest Austin, so I'm a regular commuter in Mopac. And uh, one uh, thing that I've observed is that any sort of minor disruption, even somebody just pulled over on the side to stop and look at a map, uh, causes a backup during heavy traffic. One of the uh, potential alternatives to having autonomous vehicles is to have some sort of central controller so that cars are all coordinated and people don't slow down for something like a, you know, whether it's a car accident or, um, you know, merging together. Has that been looked at at all, do you know? Actually, one of the um, technologies that is being designed into new automobiles is, um, it's called a um, remote sensing and essentially uh, it, it tells you if cars are stopped up ahead of you. Um, so it's a, it's a warning mechanism for you. Um, since, if for instance, you're coming up over a rise and you don't see the cars have stopped ahead of you, your car will tell you. Um, uh, but I don't know how it would work if somebody was just pulled over on the side of a road looking at a map. Um, so there are some sensing devices that are being designed into cars to help with that sort of traffic flow issue. That is designed into cars now and will be more commonplace, uh, I think, in the near-term future. We have a question from Pat Bula. Can you, can you tell me what the time frame is on this toll road over the lake, and is there any chance that this, the Rocky Mountain study uh, can have any influence on that? Well, that's one of the things that we're really hopeful about with the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, mobility city of the future initiative is that, that it can help bring more data and more knowledge and more thoughtfulness to our transportation planning process. But I, I can just tell you my concern is that the toll road authority is pushing and rushing to try and seal as much of the deal as they can on expanding South Mopac. I think they frankly see um, the, on the horizon the impact of autonomous vehicles and I think they want to lock in as much building as they can. And I don't, I don't think they're bad people. Their whole charter, their whole reason for existence, I think, as the board understands it, is to build toll roads. So they're doing what they were created to do. I just want them to listen more to this community and to be more thoughtful about their decision making. And I've had conversations with the chair of the board, Ray Wilkerson. He is a thoughtful person, and I think he wants uh, to do the right thing, and I just think more people need to get engaged and reach out to them and speak with them, ask them to come and talk with your uh, with your community, um, and really raise questions about this. They they have the authority that they need now. They have to finalize an environmental planning process that they're in now, um, and then they need to figure out their funding. Um, and I don't know if they're going to go to Wall Street for bonds for the toll roads, but that's certainly one scenario, and we certainly would want Wall Street to be fully informed about um, the problems with that kind of a long-term investment with their traffic projections. So um, we don't have a clear yes or no point uh, to say yes you can, no you can't with the toll road authority, but we are trying to create as much community awareness and understanding of these plans so that people can get engaged and say, this is not the vision we want for our community. This is not what we want our community to look like. A, a, a massive infrastructure like that is forever. It's very hard to tear down and take out. Yeah. We have a question from Richard Halpin. Well, you are a practical visionary, and we all applaud and appreciate your terrific you. insight. <clears throat> 
Now, um, you've done this for a while, so you have some sense about how people get organized and get to uh, do something about issues that will profoundly impact them. Uh, tell us some more suggestions, recommendations you have for simple folks like us to get active and engaged and what we can do to uh, create input to make people think about what, uh, what this MOPAC South development would do to our community. More ideas and suggestions. One of the things that, that uh, we do need people to do is um, talk to your neighborhood association, your HOA, your community, um, your church, um, and encourage them to have speakers come and, and talk about this. Keep MOPAC local. Uh, is a good local organization. They've been doing research on this issue for, for quite a while now. They will come to your neighborhood association. They'll come to your, your churches, your HOAs to, to talk with you about it. This will have an impact up and down MOPAC. It's not going to be isolated to South MOPAC. Um, and and the, the, the connector road that allows them to connect I-35 to South MOPAC is SH-45 Southwest, which cuts right across the aquifer and where U.S. Fish and Wildlife has already sent an official letter saying to TxDOT, this will cause harm. We believe this will harm the endangered species in the environment, and you've not proven that you can protect that. So there's already a, an official statement out there from the feds about it. Um, but I would say um, reach out to your neighborhood associations and let people know there's good information and that people need to be informed on it. Um, keepmopaclocal.org is also a good website. You can go there and get information um, and donate to them. Uh, it's part, they, they are engaging in a community-wide education and outreach effort, uh, and even a 5 or $10 contribution can be helpful. So those are just a couple things. Thank you for asking, Richard. Bonnie, Heather. We have a question from Catherine Govier. Um, I suspect that most of us here this afternoon are 60s, maybe 70s, even in our 80s. And some of us will not be able to drive pretty soon simply because we have either lost our eyesight or lost our ability for various reasons. How will this autonomous car situation affect those of us? Say I lose my driver's license in 10 years, and then I lose my independence but will, I, will there be something in all of this that will allow us to continue to have our driver's license? Will we need a driver's license? I'm not quite sure. I think this is great, but I, I'm not sure how this might affect me in 10 years. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm 60, and I also have teenage sons, so I'm frightened on both ends of the spectrum. I'm, I'm really terrified of my teenage son's driving, but I'm also aware that I, I will at some point lose my ability to drive. I think the advent of autonomous vehicles is hopeful across the spectrum. Um, uh, Daimler uh, Chrysler has purchased car to go and they are consolidating other pieces of this puzzle and part of their vision is they want people to be able to order uh, a car delivered to your home like you do a pizza right isn't that interesting when you think about it in that way oh, 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 okay so uh, pizza gets delivered to my house now what if I needed a car well, you can call and you know, order a car to be delivered to your home, take you to where you're going, and when, you're, when you need to go back, you order a car to take you back. I mean, that's the beauty of this, and it does require, uh, I always think of a Picasso you know, uh, face uh, image, because you have to kind of like turn things on their head to understand what's going on. It is not a one car, one person, you own it, and it sits in your driveway 90% of the time. It's a service. And the head of Ford Motor Company actually said to the Consumer Electronics um, Conference last year, Ford Motor is no longer a car manufacturer. We are a mobility provider. So even the car companies are realizing this. If, if, if these cars are not manufactured to sell to somebody, but are manufactured to provide services to people, that's very different. And, that, and that's part of the paradigm shift. But when you look at car, car utilization, the, the average car sits idle for about 96% of a day. You use it to drive to and from work, drive to and from the grocery store, dry cleaners, taking the kids to soccer, whatever, and then it sits idle. And we've been building apartments for our cars at work and at home forever. We spend more money at the state level on uh, people's uh, 
cars and provide more room in parking garages at the state for people's cars than we do for the people. The cubicles for state office workers are smaller than the cubicles for their cars. Seriously, it's a crazy system. I'm taking your questions in the order that you raise your hands or trying to, um, so hang in there. Question from Becky Halpin. Thank you, Bridget. So a couple of things. One is it's hard to imagine that these toll roads wouldn't become just terrible money losers even 10 years out from now. And the second thing is I think there's so many unintended consequences that happen. And one of them I've noticed on MOPAC already is that when they finish the renovation that they're doing now, part of it you're just going to be trapped in this kind of gray cement tunnel. I don't know if other people have noticed but there are these gray walls going up on both sides of Mopac that are supposed to be sound walls. But when you get down in there, you're just really trapped, not trapped, but visually trapped in these gray tunnels. And it's not in for. I mean, people come to Austin for the beauty, and now at least on Mopac you can look around and you feel like there's the open Texas sky. But you're not going to have that anymore when they finish just this very first part of it. It has struck me as prison walls. That's actually the sense that I've had driving along those, those sound walls. And I understand it's to protect the neighboring communities from the noise. Um, but there are many unintended consequences of toll roads. And um, one of them is an equity issue as well. And I don't think the equity piece has been talked about near enough. It will contribute to a real problem with affordability. Um, one of the ways the toll road authority is guaranteeing that the toll roads uh, will move quickly is at rush hour, they will charge a lot of money to use the tolls. They call it dynamic pricing for their express lanes. Uh, and what one of the consultants has told a couple of different uh, community gatherings is that the tolls will cost from 12 to $14 per use. And, 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 and they said that's how we keep a lot of cars off the toll roads so we can guarantee that the toll roads will move quickly. And I called an expert on this, a friend of mine, and said, you know, I've been thinking that they want to double the toll capacity so they can provide even more congestion relief, because that's the language that they use, for the majority of drivers on MOPAC. But if they price the tolls that high, it won't be available for the majority of drivers, will it? And he said, that's exactly right. These are designed, and his words were, as a relief valve special occasion utilization. If you're running late for the daycare and you're going to be fined $50, you'll pay $14 to get on the toll road. Well, that doesn't provide relief for the majority of drivers, and it certainly doesn't provide relief for low-income people. That's a scary prospect. We have about nine minutes left. Lou Ann Sledge. Um, I, in keeping with the aesthetics of Austin, um, I've really been appalled by how many huge 18-wheeler trucks go down I-35 um, all times of the day. So with my little brain, I got to thinking, why can't we utilize 130, you know, the, the toll road, take the big trucks off of there just minimally at peak time to give our cars more room to travel to and from work and because the trucks are so huge that they, you know, take up so much space that I thought, why can't we do that? And maybe, you know, of course you were saying the toll roads want to increase their their payment, but, you know, why can't they just give us that little time there, the, you know, peak hours in the morning and the afternoon? Thank you. where they pull together smart, knowledgeable people. Is my mic off? Uh, it looks like it's still on here. Uh, can you hear me all right? Okay. Anyway, the, one of the recommendations from this I-35 corridor advisory committee plan uh, was redesignating SH-130 from Georgetown down to 45 Southeast as I-35 removing, as I-35 bypass, removing the tolls on this portion of 130 and widening it. 
And then additionally, convert one lane in each direction of, now this says of the current I-35 to a dynamically priced managed lane, which is a toll lane, which is part of their plan on I-35. So they took the tolls on I-35 portion of the plan, but ignored the portion of the plan that said, we designate that as I-35 bypass and take the tolls off it, buy down the tolls. We're, we're uh, having an election in November, a statewide um, constitutional election, on whether or not to make more money available for roads, um, but not for toll roads. It specifically says this money cannot be spent on toll roads. Well, why don't we take a portion of that and pay off the debt on that toll road and make that road free and then make it a, a, a truck bypass? So these solutions are available, and they're not crazy, and they're not uh, far-fetched or even that difficult to do. It just requires real leadership in the community to do it. We have a question from Caroline Johnson. Would you stand up, please? Um, yes, I was um, thinking back to, I mean, just like when you had talked about, um, you know, you mentioned briefly, you know, like the, um, like Florida, you know, and stuff having the autonomous truck drivers in the near future. And I was just thinking about the maybe social implications of that. Like, um, I mean, if we're going to see that at a point when truck drivers or don't really need to drive, and you know, pizza delivery drivers in Austin don't need to drive, but they're in the truck, you know, um, is anyone concerned about the, um, like, it seems to me that that you know, these are, are they going to? Are, people, are we worried about people being paid a lot less because, you know, oh, you, you're, you're the pizza delivery driver, but you don't have to do anything besides just watch, so um, lower pay. I mean, is someone worried about, like, union? Is, is That's a really good question. And that was actually one of the um, presentations that we made to the Rocky Mountain Institute. And we said, we think one of Austin's distinctions is we actually care that people will be put out of work by this new technology. And we don't have the answers for it, but we think that's part of what we as a community should be looking at. So when automobiles were invented, the carriage business completely collapsed. And all the people who were involved in building carriages lost their jobs. I don't know what happened to them back then, but today we care as a community that taxi drivers may lose their jobs because of the introduction of all the ride-sharing services and the car services like Uber and Lyft. That's been a part of the big discussion at City Hall. We as a community are concerned about it. We want to uh, involve the workforce with the Rocky Mountain Institute and have that be a significant part of the puzzle. What happens to all those people who lose their jobs when the technology transforms and their piece of the work puzzle is no longer needed? What do we do about that? So that, we've, we've told Rocky Mountain Institute, we think that's an important issue. We're putting that on the table, and we think that distinguishes us from Denver, because we were down to, the final selection was between us and Denver, and we said, we think that's one of our distinctions. We're concerned about this. We're thinking about it. We're asking what impact this will have. We don't think other communities are. And they did select us. We have a question from Dr. Dana Lehman. This is not related to what you're talking about now, but I am really curious, how did CAMPO get such independent authority that doesn't connect to the community, and what do we need to do to take it away from them? That's an interesting <laughs> question, and, and the, the alphabet soup here that's difficult to keep track of is CAMPO is actually the, um, the capillary metropolitan planning organization, and it's made up of elected officials from across our region. So. Um, I'm on Campo, uh, Judge Eckhart's on Campo, Ger Commissioner Joel Doty's on Campo, Mayor Adler's on Campo, uh, Councilmember Kitchen, Councilmember Delia Garza, Councilmember uh, Sherry Gallo, and then that there's like eight or nine of us if you add us all together and, and we don't always vote the same way. But then the rest of the body, there's a, it's a 20 member body, is made up of representatives from the suburban uh, communities and the suburban counties, and we are outnumbered. So, for instance, the mayor brought a um, amendment to the Campo board on three different occasions, asking the board to support Austin and Travis County in our request to not include the expanded toll road plan in the regional transportation plan, the long range plan, and we were outvoted. And part of it was because the toll road authority has all the money. And so they show up in these communities and they say, we can help with your transportation congestion problem. We'll build a toll lane here. So 
So they built toll lanes to the east. They're building toll lanes uh, out to, uh, to Oak Hill. They're building toll lanes further up 183. And, and so they're sort of the big dogs, and they're, theirs is the, is the uh, tail that, that wags the dog of the regional planning process, and it's not a healthy one. But the Toll Road Authority was created, and I have talked to people who were involved in the creation of it, and they've said to me, we absolutely created it so that it would be uh, beyond the reach of um, citizens and it would not, ha would not be made up of elected officials who are accountable to citizens. We created it to build roads and get that done. I think we have about maybe two minutes left. Uh, we have time for a very quick question. Uh, on the ballot uh, this November is also a new courthouse. And um, we, we know, that we've discovered that about 80% of the cost of a building is in its maintenance and operation. Only 20% of the cost of a building is in its construction. Uh, will this be a five-star lead building that will have very low maintenance where well, I've heard no one talk about this uh, thing on the ballot. That, that is our commitment at the county. I think all new buildings are required to be a minimum of silver lead. Uh, so that's the requirement that they be a minimum of that. And the buildings that have been built more recently prior to my getting on the court have been above that, have been at least gold and maybe higher. So I know that's a commitment by the county um, that is part of our commitment as a current commissioner's court. And I'm already urging them, uh, for instance, to make sure that they use reclaimed water in their air conditioning system instead of treated drinking water. So that's a commitment on our part. I think we, aren't, we haven't discussed it because first we have to get voter approval to actually build it and go forward. But the commitment by the county is absolutely for it to be a, a first-rate, uh, efficient building. Are we down to how many more minutes? Just one minute. Well, uh, I want to say thank you for identifying the serious problems we're facing, but more important than that, at least opening up some possibilities for us to be able to manage these problems and perhaps arrive at uh, transformative solutions, you know, innovative solutions. It's hope inspiring. It's um, sometimes disheartening to go to meeting after meeting on transportation issues and come away discouraged uh, with no new vision for the future. So. We really appreciate having you and hope to have you back talking to us, um, certainly within a year or uh, even less. I'm happy to come back anytime. Thank you, you County yeah, Commissioner Bridget Shea. Thank you. Give her a big hand.